So <laughs> uh, real quick, thank you so much to all the organizers of Dublin JS for letting me come in and talk, especially to Pat for answering, for answering my message when I, when I reached out and asked if I could come and talk. I really appreciate it. To get back at him, I totally stole some Tic Tacs. We'll call that the speaker's fee. Yeah, we're going to call that the speaker's fee, Pat? All right. Awesome. I know, right? How dare me? <laughs> okay. So, uh, all right. Jokes aside, let's talk, let's talk about uh, building mobile apps, all right? So, oh, also, I'll totally own up. It's my fault that you're here on a Thursday night instead of your normal Tuesday because I couldn't make it on Tuesday. So, thank you again for all of you for rescheduling from your normal time. All right, so my name is Alex, and I am the dev advocate at Ionic. Uh, before, I've actually been an Ionic user for a number of years, and I was primarily an Angular 1 developer before I came to Ionic. Uh, you can reach me anytime with any questions that you have about Ionic, Angular, mobile app development, whatever, uh, on Twitter, or directly by, by email. Also, my GitHub has a lot of uh, code samples and such that I put up there over time. That is my dog, Allie. She is exactly as pissed off as she looks in that photo. <laughs> and, but I realize that my name is very long and hard to spell, so this is an easy way for you to, to know that you've actually found the right Alex in all of these places, all right? Uh, okay, so before I kind of get into details, uh, who knows what hybrid app development is? Okay, most people. So just real quick rundown for anyone who's, who's not familiar, right? When we talk, traditionally when we talk about hybrid mobile app development, we're talking about a mobile, a mobile app, right, for your phone or for your tablet or what have you, that is built with standard web technologies, HTML5, CSS, JavaScript, and then usually the way that we wrap up, uh, wrap up our code into a native executable, like an IPA file on iOS, an APK file on Android, uh, whatever file it is on Windows Phone. Any Windows Phone developers here? <laughs> okay, sweet. That means that all of my Windows jokes, totally okay. All right, so, <laughs> all right. So, uh, we, use, we, we usually we would use uh, Adobe PhoneGap, uh, the open source version of that known as Apache Cordova, right? Which uh, does two things for us. One, it, uh, again, it wraps up all of our code into a an, into an web view and puts it into a native executable, which means that we can put it into the App Store or the Google Play Store. Uh, as well, there's, in, in more recent times, uh, there are some newer frameworks that do transpiling. They actually transpile your JavaScript directly down into uh, native code, right? Uh, React Native would be a very popular uh, current, current option there. But hybrid, it's awesome. It's not necessarily like dinosaur flying a jet awesome, but pretty awesome. So just a quick, quick rundown again for people who aren't familiar, right? Some of the advantages of doing hybrid app development over native app development is one, right, you get to reuse your existing skills as a web developer, as a JavaScript developer. This is particularly awesome because you get to take all of your years of existing experience with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and extend into the mobile space and start building mobile apps can be both valuable for you as a developer as well as valuable to your company as well, right? And speaking of companies, can be very valuable to companies because uh, who has ever tried to hire an iOS or an Android developer before? <laughs> it can really be, I, in, it's different in different places, but in the US in particular, it's very, it can be actually very difficult to, to build a team of native app developers uh, and uh, as well very expensive. But many companies already have a uh, team of web developers in house, so it's a really great way to kind of repurpose and extend the team that you already have in order to build mobile apps. Uh, also, because we're talking about standard web technologies, we're talking about building with a single code base, right? Uh, that means that you get to build across all the platforms, even the BlackBerry, if you wanted to, you could do that, uh, with, with, your, with your single HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS code base. Uh, and then also a well-known but less known uh, feature of hybrid app development is the ability to do hot fixes uh, for your code. So, when you, build, when you build a standard native app, right, you're, what you do at build time is you do a full compile into an, into an APK or an IPA file, and then you deploy that to the App Store. Uh, so there's really nothing you can do to affect that bundle, right, once it's actually out there and on users' devices. But what's JavaScript really good at? Loading dynamically, right? So a kind of a lesser known feature of hybrid app development is you can take full, full advantage of that. You can actually put, make hot fixes to fix bugs, introduce new features. You could even, like if you wanted to, you could even make radical wholesale changes to your app 
dynamically, and that is absolutely 100% allowed under the App Store rules. Uh, Apple has absolutely no problem with it. The only reason, the only thing that you wouldn't be able to do is, you know, don't make an app about puppies and then turn it into an app about kittens, right? So just make sure that your app stays generally of the same flavor. Uh, and then also, mostly platform agnostic. And I say mostly just because this is a JavaScript meetup. I assume we have a lot of web developers and web app developers in the room. And you know probably all too well that some of the differences that especially CSS can have cross-platform. I'll get into that a little bit shortly, all right? Uh, and then, of course, Java is terrible, and clearly Objective-C was written on the moon, right? Who's a, <laughs> has anybody ever tried to do Objective-C development before? I, I have, you know what? I'll be totally honest. Actually, I kind of like Objective-C. Don't hate me. I kind of, I, I do, yeah, don't. <laughs> you can boo, just don't boo too loud, right? So, <laughs> uh, I actually do, I actually do like uh, Objective-C a little bit, but yeah, I mean, JavaScript uh, obviously is a lot more accessible for a lot of, for a lot of developers, right? And so uh, before I get into talking about some of the details about Ionic and Angular, uh, just start by kind of addressing, you know, the elephant in the room, as it were, right? So historically, uh, hybrid apps have quite a, quite a reputation for pro poor performance, right? A lot of people have, have heard this. It's the number one. Uh, thing that you get as far as skepticism when you first propose doing hybrid app development at a lot of at a lot of companies, right? And some of that is deserved, and some of it isn't, right? So, real quick, one thing to point out is that devices have evolved considerably. So this is the history of the hardware for, and uh, also not including the GPU for the iPhone since 2008. 2008 being when PhoneGap first hit the scene, and we first kind of really started doing hybrid app development, right? So very big impacts in terms of the evolution of the hardware, not just on, uh, the, not, not just on the ability of the phone to performantly uh, process our JavaScript, right, and render, and render our views and such from our, from our HTML and our CSS, but uh, also a lot of benefits have evolved in terms of the GPU and our ability to do things like push, uh, CS, you know, make, uh, write hardware accelerated CSS, right? And as well, web views have evolved. Um, this is another thing that is kind of le lesser talked about, I think, in the hybrid world. And that is, as of Android 4.4, we have access to the Chromium-based web view on Android. And as of iOS 8, WK web view on, uh, on iOS. So why is this a big deal, right? The big deal is these two little guys down at the bottom here. So, both of the, so uh, Chromium brings the V8, the Google V8 engine for JavaScript execution to, uh, to hybrid devices. And WK WebView brings Apple's or, or WebKit's Nitro engine. Uh, also, I just want to mention real quick. Are you listening? Yes? Okay. Nitro is actually Apple's fine little, is actually Apple's fine little uh, marketing name for the next generation of JavaScript core. Its real name, its WebKit name, is Squirrelfish. And it is, yes, yeah, Squirrelfish. Actually, the newest one, Squirrelfish Extreme. And, <laughs> and, just so happens, greatest logo in the history of software development. I'm just gonna throw that one out there, right there. Right? I mean, the LibUV one with the, with the raptor with the unicorn horn, pretty cool. Not as good as this. All right. So, but why is this important, right? The, the, bi the major thing is that when we come to Squirrelfish, when we come to Squirrelfish and when we come to V8, uh, the JavaScript compiler is now a bytecode compiler. So that means that at, that just in time, at runtime, your JavaScript is being compiled down into machine code and executed. Uh, not only does this mean it's going to actually be executed much faster, right, by the JavaScript runtime, it also means that that runtime can do a lot better static analysis of your code to optimize the execution of it as well, all right? As well, we get uh, additional features but such as native access to native scrolling. This is something that's important if you're familiar with the history of hybrid app development, right? A lot of hybrid apps historically have had issues with uh, emulated scrolling, what they call JavaScript scrolling. That, that could be rather janky. Uh, also, faster rendering, faster compute, and of course, access to the latest device APIs. So, that's awesome. We have a lot of new performance gains, right, out of the history of, of uh, the, the web views as well as the devices. But the problem is that JavaScript for mobile is still 
really rather hard, right? So this view that you see on the left, this is actually the, the, mobile, the mobile web app for a relatively prominent uh, technology conference, JavaScript, or web conference in the US. And this is from only five years ago, right? This is what we had five years ago. Think about that for a second. Any, can anybody tell me what framework this is using? jQuery Mobile, wrapped it, that, so this actually was just on the web, so it's not with PhoneGap, but yeah, this is jQuery Mobile. And anyone who has ever developed in jQuery Mobile before knows why I'm going to move on and not talk about that at all. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> so, but JavaScript for mobile, right, even, even now, still really quite hard. Few, thing, few reasons for that, right? One, no native touch events out of the box, right? JavaScript is just built to, to deal with Web events, right? Click events, for example, not tap events, not pinch and swipe and et cetera, right? Problem. Also, no native UI components. As a, as a native developer, I get SDKs such as uh, UI Kit on iOS, right? And I get the material design SDKs on Android. That means that as a baseline out of the box when I do development, I get natively styled and performant UI components that I can start building on top of. Uh, as a JavaScript developer, all I get is, guess what? JavaScript and HTML and CSS. So it's actually my responsibility to even come up, to, to develop and even come up to that baseline standard, right? So another big problem, we end up reinventing the wheel quite a lot when we talk about hybrid app development. Uh, and then of course, no performance optimizations out of the box. There's a number of things in the history of hybrid development. The, uh, some of you may be familiar with like the 300 millisecond tap delay that's, act, that's built into the browser, right? Entirely, entirely possible to optimize that out for actually quite a long time. But we've had to, on an individual basis, do that ourselves. So not, not too fun. But kind of most importantly, and looking at this fun little screenshot here that I like to joke about is no style, right? Again, all we get out of the box is JavaScript. Um, so not only do we not get that baseline, of, mo of mobile look and feel, right? We, it's very difficult to even take it beyond that and customize it and do all the things that we need to do in order to differentiate our apps. So JavaScript for mobile is quite hard. I mean, it's not like personal homepage GeoCities 1997 hard, but it's pretty hard, right? And believe me, my man Fletch worked really damn hard on this web page, right? Anybody remember how hard it was to animate the flames back in the day? Yeah. It's very difficult, right? So. Yeah, no, we're not. <laughs> um, so, yeah, not quite this hard, but pretty hard. And so, in modern hybrid development, this is where frameworks come in. So, was that? Sorry, nothing. Okay. I haven't seen one in ages. <laughs> Actually, my my favorite part of this is that this site outlived the Internet Link Exchange. Remember Link yeah. Exchanges? Come on. All right. So. This is where frameworks come into play, right? Uh, Ionic being one of them. There's actually, f there's actually still quite a number of options in terms of, hi of hybrid app frameworks. Uh, I mentioned React Native before. Native Script is, is really quite popular right now. And uh, Ionic is just, is just one option. Obviously, that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. So uh, has anybody heard of Ionic before? Mm -hmm. Nice. Has anybody worked with Ionic before? Ionic 2? Ah, I buy all of you a beer. The rest of you get out. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. So, again, for, for anyone who isn't familiar, Ionic, it's a hybrid mobile framework. It's built, it's built with uh, AngularJS and TypeScript. So, Angular or uh, Ionic 1 is built on Angular 1. Ionic 2, the new framework, is built on uh, Angular 2. And also, you build your Ionic apps with, with Angular 2 and TypeScript. All right. 100% open source under the MIT license. The framework always has been, always will be completely open source. Uh, so you can feel free to use it to, well, actually a lot of people use Ionic to learn Angular. Uh, it's a pretty, pretty common way to use it. But also it's great for prototyping apps, building internal apps, external apps, whatever. Completely open source and free. You can use it for commercial use, what have you. Uh, and the really important one that I always like to point out is it's built 100% on web and browser standards. So very significant for people like all of you in this room who are web develop who are web developers, right? By experience, because that means that with I using Ionic, you really can take your existing skills and very quickly repurpose them into mobile app development. 
Uh, Ionic, really quite popular. Over 25,000 over 25, stars on GitHub. It's the number one TypeScript project. It's even more popular than Visual Studio Code, which is the official IDE of TypeScript. Pretty fun for us. Uh, has consistently been anywhere between like a top 15 and a top 50 project overall on GitHub. Uh, and, but the thing that I really like to point out is there have been hundreds of contributors. Like I said, it's an open source framework and we have an amazing developer community. So if you, whether you're an Ionic developer or whether you're the kind of person that likes to actually contribute to open source, it's a, it's a great community and our, we, have very, we have a very active forum, help forum and a worldwide Slack and nobody will, and if you, you can ask questions there and no one will even snark at you like on Stack Overflow. It's pretty awesome. All right. Uh, also, over 200,000 NPM installs per month. This is pretty significant for us because uh, this is, uh, that number is actually Ionic 1 and Ionic 2 combined. Uh, Ionic 2, which is just recently in release candidate, already accounts for over a full third of those installs. So there's already actually quite a lot of people using Ionic 2 as well as uh, not just trying it out, but also in production as well. Uh, in fact, I was just in London and talking to somebody who has uh, over 10 <laughs> Ionic 2 apps already, already in production in the App Store. Pretty exciting for us. So just recently in the release candidate, we actually announced RC0 at Angular Connect, which was, which was in London. I almost said here in London. Don't hate me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> so which was in London uh, about a month ago. Uh, and right now we're in RC1. RC2 will come out any day now, like literally any day now, uh, and the final release also very, very soon, okay? Companies, like I said, also, also are really into Ionic. Ion both Ionic 1 and Ionic 2 have been used very extensively uh, for both internal and external apps by really major companies. The only reason why I show this slide is just to give you the, just to give you the sense that the framework I is very mature, right? And it is used at enterprise scale. So it can really do all the things that you, that you wanted to do with a lot of users, all right? If you're interested in trying it out, NPM install, uh, Ionic, and then also <coughs> Cord you need Cordova, obviously, if you want to do any kind of bundling and deploying. And then that second command, Ionic start, will just scaffold a basic uh, skeleton app for you. And I'll, we'll take a look at that in just a little bit. So one of the first things that a lot of people learn about Ionic is that it's a set of UI components, right? It, so primarily a lot of people know Ionic as a UI framework. So that means that it provides all kinds of stuff for you, right? One way to think about Ionic is sort of as the SDK for the mobile web. Um, remember I mentioned how as a native developer you get things like UI kit out of the box, right? So Ionic as a framework does a really nice job of filling that absence for you. So all kinds of stuff, everything from side menus to date pickers to range sliders, action sheets, toggle switches. Uh, you can see over here there's, uh, there's directives to handle layout with grid, right? So anyone who's done bootstrap before on the web, this will be kind of a very familiar layout uh, option for, layout option for them. And all of these things are optimized for touch events out of the box, right? So, all, so everything here will perform, uh, in terms of the user interaction, will perform just like native for you, right? As well, uh, you know, obviously we, we want to go beyond just the baseline look and feel. So theming, very easy in, uh, in Ionic. And again, 100% based on web standards, right? So plain CSS and SAS. If you can do, if you can do CSS, you can, you can restyle and customize any part of Ionic very easily. Uh, and you can do it the same way that you would do a website. You can just introspect the CSS in the browser, make changes, update it, and do the overrides, okay? So very easy to override, both on a component level, right, an individual UI component level, as well as on a global level, if you want to. Uh, and because we're using SAS, uh, all of our styling for the UI components is variables-based. Uh, this was actually present in Ionic 1, but in Ionic 2, we've really expanded it. So just about every single bit of look and feel that you'll see in UI components in Ionic 2 have a SAS variable assigned. So if you prefer to do you know, that kind of declarative overriding instead, you can totally do that. Uh, as, well, oh, as well, over 80 mixins uh, to get you kind of started on some base theming. As, and also over tw uh, 25 what we call utility attributes. I'll show some of those a little bit later. 
uh, but these just handle very common uh, formatting use cases, things like vertical aligning, left and right aligning, text wrapping, et cetera, all right? We also have another open source project called Ionicons. This is almost a thousand icons. This is open source under the MIT license. Almost all of these actually were hand designed by our co-founder, uh, Ben. Yeah, there, and you'll see that they, a lot of them come in, uh, what's that? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> actually, off the top of my head, I'd have to check, I'd have to double check for you, but, um, so, and you'll notice that a lot of these come in various, uh, in sets, right? And that's because all the icons are also styled cross-platform for you, right? So you, have, so you have Windows Universal, Material Design, and iOS flavors of, of everything, all right? Pretty, pretty useful. And again, also open source under the MIT license, 100% free to use. For access to uh, native device APIs, right, things like the accelerometer, the camera, the uh, Bluetooth low energy, right? Like all the things that a native app would have access to using native, using native device SDKs or APIs, uh, you can get access to using you know, traditionally Cordova, right? So Ionic Native is another open source project that we introduced at the beginning of the year. And what it is is it provides TypeScript wrappers around existing Cordova plugins, all right? Uh, not only does this give us some of the nice features of TypeScript, which I'll talk about a little bit shortly, but it also adds promises and observables support, promise and observable support to, uh, to existing Cordova plugins, right? So for anyone who's done Cordova development before, you know that many Cordova plugins were actually written quite some time ago in a lot of cases, and so many of them are still just implementing a standard callback pattern, right? So one of the nice things about Ionic Native is it helps kind of bring a lot of those plugins up to the modern day of JavaScript development by adding promise and observable support for us. Uh, and also framework agnostic. It's called Ionic Native. You don't have to use it in an Ionic proje project. You can use it in any TypeScript project. Looks kind of like this. Uh, this is just an example of the geolocation plugin. I use this because as web app developers, probably every single person in this room has had to use geo geolocation before. So you can see we're just importing the dependency from Ionic Native, and then you don't even have to really, I don't really even have to explain to you what's actually going on in these function calls, right? We're just getting current position, it's returning a promise, right? And then we're handling the promise. Same watch position, it's going to return continuously, so it's implemented as an observable instead. So this, you know, so it's pretty cool, the UI components, you have access to native device APIs, we have the, the icons, all that good stuff, but none of it really matters unless it performs well, right? At the end of the day, what, the, what we're always trying to do at Ionic is to measure the, the <coughs> performance of the framework against native, because if it doesn't look and feel and perform like native, kinda doesn't matter too much, right? So the framework does very minimal DOM manipulation to increase performance. Uh, and the and a whole variety of optimizations all over the place, and the result of this is you get jank-free page transitions when you transition from view to view inside of your app. Uh, we all of the animations that you see inside of the UI components in Ionic. So, for example, when you tap a side menu and the side menu slides in and out, right? All those animations are either hardware they're either um, hardware accelerated CSS or using the Web Animations API in order to make them. Uh, perform at, at or very near 60 frames per second. In fact, almost all of the animations that you'll see in Ionic components perform at 60 frames per second. And in the rare instances where they don't, the differential is in the single milliseconds. Um, if you want to see proof of that, I could put you in touch with the guy who does all of our performance testing. He's amazing. Um, all right, and then of course, like I said, optimize for touch events out of the box. and ahead of time compiling, I'll get into shortly after talking a little bit about Angular, right? So like I said, Ionic, is, Ionic 2 is built on Angular 2 and you write it in, with Angular 2. And Angular 2 is awesome. Who has done Angular 1 development? A lot of people, wow. Who's done Angular 2 development? For all of you who didn't raise your hand the second time, switch. Angular 2 is way better. Like it, it performs better, it's easier to learn, it's awesome. Uh, just a few things, right? 
It's got it's it's component based. It's much much easier to compose an app in Angular 2, and also to kind of reason about the the architecture of your applications, and design from the ground up for mobile as well. Right. One of the things about Angular 1 is that it's always had kind of a difficult story when it comes to to running on mobile. And it's just because it was released in 2010, right? It was built for web apps on the desktop. So ang when Angular 2 was conceived, it was specifically designed in order to run very well on, with the resource constraints uh, of mobile. Uh, there's a, an improved dependency, inject d improved dependency injection system that is much nicer to use. I won't get too deeply into that, but if you have questions about it, happy to answer them. And adds TypeScript to the party. Now, you don't have to write an Angular 2 app or an Ionic 2 app in TypeScript. You can write it in standard ECMAScript. You can write it in standard JavaScript. <coughs> I wouldn't suggest it because <laughs> you get a lot of really cool stuff when you write in TypeScript. And believe me, I was as skeptical about TypeScript as like anybody in the world, but it, it is really awesome. Um, for if you're not familiar, <laughs> try it, man. It's awesome. <laughs> All right. So, TypeScript, it's a superset of JavaScript. That means that you write, you write your TypeScript and at build time, right, it compiles down to standard JavaScript for you. Brings a lot of cool stuff to the party, uh, the least of which actually is, it handles all the polyfills for you for, e for full ES6 support. Uh, and of course the big thing is static type, is it adds static typing to JavaScript. Now as JavaScript developers, I know what you're thinking. I hate types, what do I need types? If I wanted to do types, I would have done Java, gross, right? I said the same thing. But it actually will save you so much, so much development time just having, just ha even using a little bit of that static typing because of, because of the uh, type analysis that can happen uh, both as you're developing and at build time as well, right? You'll catch an unbelievable amount of bugs uh, before they kind of even, before they kind of even surface. Um, <coughs> as well, improves the tooling very great, very greatly for JavaScript development. When you when you use TypeScript, that means that your IDE can also do static type analysis, and so we get better features like much, much improved code hinting in our IDEs, as well as much easier uh, implementation of certain cool features like uh, like mass code refactoring. Right. And one of the biggest things that we get out of using Angular two. Uh, I, either just as <laughs> Angular 2 or as, as an Ionic app, is this feature of ahead of time compiling. We get huge performance gains out of this. So this was actually introduced not very long before Angular 2 had its final release at the end of September, I think it was. Um, for anyone who's not familiar with ahead of time compiling, so traditionally when we built an Angular application, uh, what, what happened was we had our Angular code, right? All of our crazy controllers and directives and whatnot. And at, build, er, at runtime, just, there was a just-in-time compiler that would compile our Angular code to standard JavaScript that, that uh, the squirrelfish, the, fan, the friendly squirrelfish, could uh, actually execute for us. This, did not, this came with a not inconsiderable performance penalty, right? As well as a size penalty to the bundles that we were shipping. So, what ahead of time compiling does is it allows us to move this, this compile step from runtime to build time, all right? Uh, not only does this mean that we get dramatically smaller bundles because we don't ship the Angular compiler with our code in the end, uh, because, we're, because thanks to TypeScript uh, and, the, and the static type analysis we get out of that, when we run the compile at, when we run the compile at build time instead, we can, do, we can do things like code optimization, in particular, a feature called tree shaking. So what tree shaking does is it, actu it actually traverses the dependency tree at build time, and it, sh and it literally, uh, what they call, shakes out unused code. So you can imagine the impact of this, especially in a modern, in a modern JavaScript project, which has you know, your node modules folder, which is you know, 8,000 8, gigabytes or whatever, okay? So pretty cool. Uh, and the, but at the end of the day, the big advantage of that is going to be you're going to have significantly faster app launches and significantly faster uh, component loading as your, as your app kind of lazy loads components in, all right? Uh, just to give you a little bit of an idea, 
the Angular team has told us that with, with AOT and uh, tree shaking, they've gotten their Hello World app down to as small as 28K. Now to put that in perspective, 28K is the size of jQuery gzipped. So we're talking, you know, pretty significant, right? Uh, and Angular 2, very easy. So much easier than Angular 1 ever was. So much more, so much more approachable, right? Uh, and not just so much more approachable as a JavaScript developer learning it for the first time. Also, one of the nice things about TypeScript is it adds some, some very common programming constructs to JavaScript for us that makes it much more approachable for other types of developers, you know, uh, traditional Java or C Sharp developers, for example, right? So things like classes and extending classes and implementing interfaces and these sorts of things are added in. So pretty easy to see what's going on in this quick code sample. So at the top, right, I'm just doing my, my dependency injection, pulling in a few modules, right, as dependencies. TypeScript then also uh, introduces this concept of decorators. So a decorator just adds metadata to a class. And this tells the, the Angular compiler what to do with this class, like what it is. So in this case, we're using the component decorator and, the, and it's just defining the template and the CSS that's attached to this particular, this particular Angular component. Uh, here I've inlined it just so that you can see it all together in one file. Obviously you can externalize it as well, not a problem. And then what we classically think is the controller in Angular 1, right, is just an exported class. Uh, here, uh, I can't really, I'll step over here for a second. Here, <laughs> so here, you can see that we're, that we're just instantiating, right? We're creating instances of some of our dependencies, and then down below in the constructor as well, right? We're just, we're, instead of the old dollar sign scope, which is a little bit of a nightmare, we have a much more standard this construct, all right? On the template side of things, when it comes to Ionic, even easier, right? Uh, all, almost everything, almost all of the UI components that you see are implemented as standard custom, custom directives, right? Custom HTML elements with, declar with declarative attributes for some of the uh, customization uh, for, their, for their behavior as well. Okay, so what this means at the end of the day is that it's easier than ever to fulfill kind of the original promise, to realize the original promise of hybrid app development which is you're going to code once, run everywhere. You have a single team, a single code base, and you're going to be able to run across every platform. And when I say that, I don't just mean hybrid app development, right? Again, Ionic completely built on web and browser standards, so it's also great for the mobile web, as well as kind of some of the things that are coming next. So Pat had mentioned that next week there's going to be a talk on progressive web apps. Uh, who's familiar with progressive web apps? Wow, a lot of people. Okay, cool. So. Progressive Web App, I won't go into it too much, right? But for anyone, for anyone unfamiliar, Progressive Web App is going to be a, m a mobile app that's essentially served from the web. It will install to your home screen with an icon. It will look just like a native app, except it will be completely separate from, it'll, it will be distributed through the web. It won't be distributed through the App Store. It will have offline capabilities, all that good stuff. Google has been making a lot of noise about this recently. So because Ionic is built on web and browser standards, all you need to do is drop in a manifest file, a web manifest file, and a service worker, and your Ionic app is already a progressive web app. Pretty cool. Uh, it, and it may, so yeah, it makes it really great for some of the things that are potentially coming next for mobile as well. And when I say that you can code once and run everywhere, it's not just, oh yeah, my code can execute everywhere. We give you a whole bunch of cross-platform styling for free as well. So this is a view from what we call uh, Ionic Lab. And this is part of our command line, one of our command line tools. And it'll just generate in your browser a side-by-side -side view of, what's go of what your app will look like across the three major platforms. And, <clears throat> and all the differences that you see here, everything from the default system font to the size and positioning of the search bar to even very small things like the average height of list elements, all of these things, 100% for free. I, this is all one code base. I did absolutely nothing to customize these views, right? Uh, so a, co a really cool thing about Ionic 2 is the default styling cross-platform that you get conforms very tightly to the style guides for each of the major platforms. So we have themes for 
uh, for iOS, material design, and Windows Universal, right? Uh, and in, obviously those style guides don't always give you exactly, they don't always exactly uh, define what something should do or should look like. So in those cases, we do a little bit of a survey of existing apps to make it kind of conform to the look and feel of those platforms as much as possible. Now I will shut up and I will code because code speaks louder than words. Yes? All right. So really quick, this is what I'm gonna build really quick. So this, is, this just implements some geolocation. It's got a list. Uh, this is showing through QuickTime. So any, any like scroll jank that you see there is just because QuickTime is trying to, to catch up. If you need proof, I'll show it to you. <laughs> And I'm just gonna implement a really quick app where I can search for nearby stuff, all right? Especially restaurants. Because I don't know how all of you feel, but at the end of listening to myself talk for 30 minutes, I need a drink. And so this will help us get there, all right? There's what? There's a, we have a bar in the office. Even <laughs> better, even better. Pat, please stand by. <laughs> All right, so real quick, just inside of the project, I'm gonna run Ionic Serve, right? And all this is gonna do is it's gonna start a little local web server for me so that I can start doing development in the browser, right? All web technologies, that means that all the development uh, can be done, especially all of the visual development, right? Can be done right in the browser and we can take advantage of Chrome DevTools. While we're waiting for that, I'll just take, I'll just take you on a quick tour of the project. So all I did here was, oh, here you go. So I could, I could be lazy and I could do it the way that we used to do it in hybrid development and say like, yeah, that looks like a mobile device. Okay. <laughs> we won't do that. We'll use, we'll use the awesome tools that we now have at our disposal in Chrome. So really cool, this little, this little icon up here, right? We'll toggle back and forth and we can even do emulation of different devices. So if I wanted to see what was on a Nexus 5X, right? We get all, that, all those views. Uh, and you can do all kinds of stuff. Uh, if you want to talk about what's available inside of the Chrome tools, I can talk about that later. Uh, all right, so just here I've uh, created a standard, you know, just kind of blank template project, and I've just added some of the boilerplate already so that you don't have to sit here and watch me like write, write Reactive JS and all this crap, all right? But just a quick tour of the, of the project, right? I have my node modules folder. I, I know that this is probably hard to see, but uh, Sublime won't let me blow up that menu, <laughs> sorry. But I have like node modules, right? So anything that you can do, right, in a standard web app, in a standard Angular application, right, you can do in an Ionic application, all of the dependencies and such. Uh, also, I have a config.xml file down here for people who have used uh, Cordova before. This is, that's, this is that config.xml file to do whatever customizations you want there on the config. Package.json, right? Very familiar to most people who have done uh, who have done web development, as well as a tsconfig file for all of your TypeScript configurations. If you want to do handy dandy things there, here in the www folder, I have an index.html, the proverbial single page of your single page application. The only thing that I'll point out here is you can see this Ion app directive, right? And this is where the app is actually injected into the DOM and rendered and bootstrapped. We don't really care about that, to be honest. The thing that we do care about is this source directory, all right? And uh, just some of the things, there's an assets directory where you can put any static assets, right, that you want to include in your project. There's a theme directory. Here's a variables file where you can handle some of the, uh, some of that variable declaration, that SAS declaration that I talked about earlier. Uh, we have first class support for progressive web apps in Ionic 2, so you get a default manifest file in Service Worker if you want to play with that. And what we really care about is this pages directory. So by default, I get this home, uh, this home page, right, which is, guess what, the home page of my app. And that has a template file. I've, pre, I've predefined about like 10 lines of CSS just so that you don't have to watch me write CSS because that's boring. <laughs> and a TypeScript file, and this is my controller. So here, I have some dependencies that I'm importing, including Angular's default HTTP module, which is just going to handle change detection and orchestration of all my AJAX requests, right? I'm importing RxJS, 
for, because observables uh, are preferred in Angular 2. Don't be mad at me, I didn't make that decision. So, <laughs> but you can promiseify things too if you want. Uh, here in the component decorator, you'll see we have the selector. So the selector is the actual uh, HTML element that will be injected to, into the DOM for this page. So when we, if, I'm not gonna bother to do it, but if we did inspect the DOM over here, you would see that there was a node called page, page home. And then, uh, and then uh, a, a, a link to uh, where the template is, which is relative to this file. So that's just pointing at this home.html file right here, all right? Oops. All right, and then, can everyone, is this big enough? Everyone can see okay? Cool. And then, I, so what I'm gonna do in this, in this particular example is, I've just set up a crappy little uh, node API that's proxying out to Foursquare. You guys use Foursquare in Dublin? Is that a thing? Yeah, kind, of. kind of? You know what it is though. Yeah. All right, cool, all right. So, yeah, it is a bit old, I agree. <laughs> Don't tell them that. All right, uh, so I just have an API set up and it can, it can accept uh, latitude and longitude, right, to give me back my geolocation, right, uh, my, my places that are nearby. And it's going to return, so I'm declaring this restaurants variable, which is going to hold an array of objects, right, so that's the array that's gonna come back from the API. I'm also saying that there's gonna be a search term, there's gonna be a string, right, because I had a search field that I want to actually develop for, and then, in the constructor, instantiating, creating instances of some of my dependencies. Then I'm calling a member function get restaurants, which is here, which is calling on to this request function. And all the request function is doing is it's actually making the HTTP request for me, right? Clear to everybody? Cool. Aren't you glad that I didn't make you watch me write that? All right. So to start, what I'll do is I'll come over to, the, to my template file, and you see we have this ion header, right? So the ion header is just a directive that represents the header bar, surprise, of our, of our app, right? And this is the title. So this, li this li library loads for me uh, when I use ionic serves, so like if I wanna change this to restaurants, it saves, and then you can see like it runs the, the library load here, it takes a second. And when it's done, right, I get, I get the updated stuff. So down here, ion content represents everything in the content of the, of the page that's below the header. So I'm gonna start by using ion list. And inside of ion list, I'm gonna put an ion item. These are analogous to your, to your standard uh, unordered list, your UL and your LI tags. But in this case, we're going to use the Ionic versions of them so that we get not only the styling, right, to, because we don't want an HTML looking list, right, we want a mobile looking list. So we get the styling and as well, we'll get a lot of the added optimizations for things like scrolling of long lists, uh, you know, sensitivity to tap events, et cetera. And I want an item for every, to be rendered for every uh, object, right, that's gonna be returned in that restaurants array. So I say ng4, let restaurant of restaurants. So this is that restaurants array, right? And I'm, for anyone who's done Angular 1, who's not familiar with Angular 2, what's that? Oh, where? Oh, foe, yeah. I said that I could develop, I didn't say I could spell. All right, <laughs> so ng, ng4 is the new version of ng repeat, all right? So now if I save this and I let it go, Come back. And you'll see, right, it's already, I haven't put anything in, but it's already rendering the list items for me. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, engage in the great tradition of developers everywhere, and I'm going to use copy and paste because you do not want to watch me write boilerplate template code because that would be very boring. Don't pretend like you don't do it, you bunch of cheat and stack overflow users, I know you do, <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, uh, just what, a couple things to point out. You can see this is a standard image tag, except I'm, I'm, this is the uh, square brackets, right? This is Angular 2 syntax to bind 
the, the value of the source tag to something that's on the model, in this case, the thumbnail property of the restaurant for this particular iteration. And then this uh, double curly brace is a two-way data binding, right? And that just tells it to inject that value into the DOM. So I'm gonna save this. I should have saved that while I was talking so that you didn't have to watch. There we go. Cool. So we have so we have an app, so break out the beers, Pat. Let's do it. Yeah? Sweet. All right, no, it's ugly, right? We can't have that. We want something that's much better looking than that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna handle some of the layout using that grid that I told you about before. So inside of the list item, I'm gonna use ion grid. And similar to how uh, it works in Bootstrap, right? There's a row. And I'm obsessive compulsive, so I'm gonna make sure my tabs are good. As you do, right? And we'll wait for it to reload. Cool. Better. Still not great, right? But you can see that it is, it's handling some stuff, right? Like it's inlining for us. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just add columns inside of the row. Very easy. And again, I'm obsessive compulsive. Build runs. Can we come back? Much better. Still ugly though, right? Still need to do, do more. We have a number of problems, right? One, we have like some things that have very long titles that probably should text wrap. The, this right column should probably be right aligned. Uh, we, we, you know, we're getting these uh, images that are squashed, right? So this is where some of those utility attributes I was talking about will come into play. So here on the item, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say text wrap, and then here on the left column, I'm going to give it a width of 25, and down here on the right column, I'm going to give it a width of 20. What's that? It's a dash. So this is just a declarative attribute. So, and then I'm gonna say text right, like this. When it reloads. Uh, so while we're waiting for this, I'll just point out that the grid is, is based on Flexbox, right? So now you can see, I get some very nice, I get some very nice formatting, right? And then including this text wrapping is happening for me, right? And because this is Flexbox, I said that the left column is 25 and then the right column is 20, so the middle column is just automatically filling in in the middle, right, as Flexbox does. Cool. But w still a couple things, right? We probably want, see we have like numbers here, we want like stars for our rating, right, because that's what's in um, this guy over here. Also, we probably want Euro signs, right, Euros? Euros they use in Dublin? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. Um, so, here, I'll just add these in. What's the minimum browser score for this? I don't know off the top of my head. You can go pretty far back. I mean, I mo mostly you'll get just performance degradations. Um, I mean, definitely you want, you want Android 4.4 and above and, and probably iOS 8 and above. But the good news is, is iOS 8 is something like nine, has like 98% adoption worldwide and 4.4 and above has like 95%. So unless you're, basically unless you're trying to build apps for the third world, yeah. no, I mean like literally, literally, <laughs> like unless you're trying to build apps for like the third world. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then you could use Crosswalk on Android, right? Um, so, and yeah, and if, if you're using like below iOS 8, the Apple police come and like get you, yeah. right? <laughs> All right, so here you can just see I'm using uh, the ion icon directive. So this, is, this will insert some of those ionicons that I told you about. The name property just tells it which one to use. So I say name equals star. And then uh, I just want as many stars, right, as the rating. Uh, but remember, the rating was a number. NG4 can only iterate over, guess what, an iterable. Guess what a number is not an iterable, right? So uh, I cheat a little bit, and actually this will be very valuable to anybody who does <laughs> Angular development in the future, because I guarantee you'll look this up on Stack Overflow. Um, I just have this little helper function, get array, 
which is defined down here. And you can see I just pass it a number with the size, and then it's just going to return an empty array of the size I need. That gives ng4 something to iterate over, right? And uh, real quick, I'll go ahead and put in my price as well, right? And I'll change this to logo euro instead of USD. I'll give it a second to restart. I got my stars and my euros, right? So last thing that we need to do, well, two things we need to do, right? One, we need to make this location aware. And then the last thing is we need to go ahead and put in our search as well, right? So let's do location awareness first. Um, what I need to do is, uh, like in the code sample that I showed you before, I'm going to come and I'm going to just import geolocation from Ionic Native. Normally, I would then need to come over here to the command line and say Ionic plugin add, oops, Ionic plugin add, and then I would just add it by its Cordova package name. So I would say Cordova plugin geolocation, and it would do the NPM install and all this magic for me. Don't want you to have to watch me do that, so I've already done it. Doesn't use YARN that no. What's that? Doesn't use YARN that no. I'm sorry, I can It doesn't use YARN that no. No, it does not use YARN. Uh, but literally, 12 hours after Yarn was announced, somebody opened a ticket on the project asking us to switch to Yarn. <laughs> they said, you know, we're not ready yet. <laughs> um, so now I've imported geolocation as a dependency. Geolocation has, stat has static methods. It doesn't need to ha have an instance created, so I can just call directly on it. So what I'm going to do is I need one other dependency, which is this platform dependency. So platform represents is an object that represents the Ionic platform because, so Ionic, the Ionic platform, right, is what's actually going to um, inject Cordova, right? Make Cordova go inside of our app. So we want to make sure that uh, Ionic fully loads before we try to access anything in Cordova. That way we don't end up with a race condition. So here in get restaurants, I'm going to say this dot platform dot ready, right? And this will return a promise. It returns nothing, and then when that's done, I say geolocation, and look at look at this nice TypeScript code hinting, right? Get current position, right? And that will also return a promise, which returns a location object. You will also notice that, like a proper JavaScript developer, I'm handling none of my errors, <laughs> right? And then I'm going to call this dot request, and I'm going to just pass the location that location object, okay, into request, which will then make my query. So right now, the app is just returning to me um, places in beautiful Madison, Wisconsin, where Ionic is actually based. Anybody know where Madison is? That's okay. Most people in the United States don't know where it is either. It's fine. Um, uh, kind of. <laughs> All right. It's near that 70s show. It's near that 70s show, yes. There you go. All right. So I'm just going to uh, replace this query. And so just write this is just a template string that's going to take the latitude and longitude from that location object for me. Right? Wait, where does location come from? Location is coming from here, from the call to get current position. And when it, return, when it gets the location, it returns the location to me. Then I'm passing it on and actually invoking request there. All right? Uh, can I have a quick TypeScript question? Sorry, it's yeah, no, no problem. Uh, I notice you define location as object there. Can you define it like as in a proper type of language, like an instance of something? Can you define yeah, it yeah. So, so you could you could actually yeah you could actually like create your own static type definitions and do that. Right. Uh, and in fact, doing object here like generic object is kind of not not the ideal way to do it in TypeScript because it, it doesn't know what's in the object. Yeah. So like for example, right, you'll notice here that I'm using, I'm, I'm using, you know, I'm using bracket notation instead of dot notation and it's because the TypeScript compiler would complain about dot notation, right? Because it has no idea what's inside of that location object, exactly. Yeah. Cool. So now if we come back here, we see that we're getting things in Dublin, right? Geolocation is happening. 
Let's add search. This is the easiest and fastest thing to do. So just right here above the list, I'm going to say ion search bar. And I'm going to add two attributes to it. The first is going to be ng model. This is a standard uh, structural directive in Angular. Or, uh, not structural, it's a standard directive in Angular that's just going to bind the input, the value inside of the input, right, the search input, to a variable on the model, which is going to be, remember I defined that search term string before. So whatever gets typed into the search field is just going to end up bound to that search term string. Uh, this, by the way, for anyone who's, who's curious, the syntax is uh, what they call banana in a box for obvious reasons. <laughs> and it's just the way that, I, at an attribute level, the way that we represent a two-way data binding in Angular 2. And then I'm going to do a binding to Angular's search event. So the, the Angular will emit this event whenever, uh, whenever you know, I'm using, I type into a search field and I hit go on my phone. It'll emit the search event. And when that happens, I'm going to tell it to just do the get restaurants, right? So I save this. Wait for it to load. Cool. So it because because the template because the decorator right binds the template to this oh, class right? right? Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. The the question was. How does, how does it know what scope get restaurants is on? Because I didn't call like this dot get restaurants. And it's because, right, the, remember the component decorator defines the template for this class. So it automatically knows that the scope that it's talking to, it's not really, it's not really scope anymore, right? Because it's Angular yeah. 2. But the scope that it's talking to, it knows that it's for that, for that particular class, right? So now I have this. And I need a pub so badly. <laughs> so we'll search for a pub. Obviously, in a production app, I would put a little spinner there. There's also, a, there's also an Ionic directive to handle that for you. And now I get pubs that are nearby as well, right? So not too bad. Um, last thing to do is to actually get it running on a device, right? So uh, an easy way to do this is we have a free app. It's called Ionic View. And what this allows you to do is to just, uh, from the command line inside of your Inside of your project directory, you can run Ionic upload. It'll, t it'll do a full production build and upload the bundle file to an Ionic server. And then you can actually pass some, give somebody who has Ionic View an app ID, and it'll do the download, and it allows you to share with them. This is really great, especially if you have uh, uh, one of two things. Either you have a lot of clients, right, and they want to see your incremental work as you're, as you're moving along, or you have a director that couldn't get something to like test flight to work for their lives. Uh, really great for, for keeping them up to date on what you have actually going on. So if you want, you can download it. View.io has links to the App Store and the Google Play Store. And this app ID will show you the exact app that I just built. All right? If you want to do a full deploy to a device for actual testing, it's a little harder. So on Android, you have to enable developer options. I cannot tell you how to do this on your phone because it's a little different on every Android device. It usually involves going into like settings and finding the about phone button and tapping it between like three and 700 times and singing the little song to it so that it enables developer options. Then you go into the developer options and you enable USB debugging so that your, so that your uh, laptop, your computer can actually talk to the device, the Android phone through USB, all right? Apple. Even harder, you have to create a provisioning profile, then you have to code sign the IPNX code, and then you have to install this little NPM dependency that's called iOS deploy, which takes a little bit of time, and you need to do something with unsafe perm. There's various steps to it. And also, you need an Apple developer account, right? Who's alarmed by the sound of my voice, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> the tone of my voice. No, you no longer need that. As of iOS 9, you no longer need a paid Apple, uh, a paid Apple developer account in order to develop on your own phone. Before iOS 9, this was the case. So if you go to this link, which is actually kind of being blocked by the video of my ugly face down here. Uh, if, you go to, if you go to this link, uh, I've written up, I've done a full write-up of how you can actually do that. And all you need is a free Apple ID in order to do local testing. But, sorry PC users, <laughs> sorry PC users, you still need a Mac, right? Because never, ever, 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 
ever. Will you be able to build? Will you be able to build a uh, an iOS app using a PC? Just won't happen. Steve Jobs precluded that many, many, many years ago. Right. So I've already done all these steps, so that again you don't have to watch me do them. Oh, wait, I'll come back to that in a second. So all that I have to do now is come back here and say Ionic. Wait, what did I do here? Oops, hang on. There we go. All right. Ionic run iOS dash dash device. This is going to do a whole lot of song and dance. We'll watch it over here on the phone. Ah, I knew that was going to happen. I do not want iOS 10. Thank you very much. <laughs> Be wary of your iOS upgrades when it comes to Xcode compatibility, by the way. <laughs> Ask me how I know that. Um, OK, so this build is actually going to take a little bit longer because it's going to do the full production build with all the ahead of time compiling and everything, right? So that it can deploy a proper, a proper finished bundle. So you can see like here, it was running NGC. So NGC is the, is the Angular command line tool for building. So you can see that actually took a pretty good amount of time, about 22 seconds, right, to complete. It does a bunch of other, a bunch of other nice stuff for us. Yes, yeah. So uh, every time, every time a new, <laughs> every time a, a new version comes out of iOS, the world breaks. Number one, but number two, uh, yeah, we we very quickly make sure that everything is compatible. I'm sorry, what's that? Do you need the new Mac Pro? <laughs> no, because then you won't have an escape key, and then you can't do anything. <laughs> um, Cool. All right, so that ran, and it launches. And I have my app running, and it does geolocation, right? And again, I look for a pub, and I got my pubs, right? So it's all running. So here's the thing, right? Is that's, it's, this is like a pretty basic, pretty rudimentary app, but we have interaction, we have geolocation, we're using device, you know, we're using the actual GPS on the device, we have uh, you know, again, it, it janks a little bit because I'm using QuickTime, but we have full, you know, 60 frame per second sc native scrolling being used. And we did all of it with 35 lines of template code, about 10 lines of CSS, and about 40 lines, about 45 lines of controller code, right? So, not too bad. Um, that is all of the listening to the sound of my ugly California accent that you have to do this evening. Uh, but if you want more information, we have awesome docs. And again, Ionic, Web and Browser Standards, that means that the docs can be fully interactive. You can actually see what, what's going to happen with, uh, with the things that are being covered in the docs. Pretty cool. Uh, as well, blog, very developer-focused blog. I write tutorials there. Other people write tutorials there. We do a bunch of stuff. We have a Twitter account. and. Who doesn't need a little more Twitter in their life, right? So we also have a second Twitter account, which is Ionitron. He's our friendly little build bot that's down there in the corner. He, if, you're, if you're an Ionic developer, actually, that's a really good account to follow because that's where our release notes and stuff get announced on. So good to have. And then as well, if you do fancy yourself of the open source variety, please do contribute. As I said, hundreds of developers have already contributed to the framework, to Ionic 1 and Ionic 2, as well as uh, and everything is open source, right? So the framework, Ionic Native, the Ionic CLI. Uh, I cannot contribute to the CLI because I am terrible at Bash. But maybe you're not, right? And if you're not, and you and you know you want to contribute to a pretty cool open source project, please do. Uh, with that, thank you very much. You can, again, you can contact me for any questions that you might have, and uh, you can actually ask me any questions you have now as well. I'm probably am I a little over on time, maybe. Tiny bit. Tiny bit. Ah, sweet. All right, thank you. So I say we have time for two questions, um, so make them good ones, no pressure. <laughs> I'm sure, yeah, here we go. When I was, uh, first of all, thank you for for this uh, slide and the explication was very good. I was using Ionic in the first version. I was having problems to customize some <coughs> components. 
because sometimes, for example, I was building a tabs, a Ionic tabs component, and this is bringing a lot of HTML and a lot of components inside. Yep. So sometimes I was having problem because in the browser it was rendering away, and then in the device in another way. So I didn't know exactly how to access to this code inside. And I'm not sure if this improved in the second version. And the second question, if I can do it. Yeah, yeah all right. So <clears throat> how will you be able to deploy this? Uh, because I, as we saw, we can build this application to web, to Android and everything. Yeah. How can we export it to a, a normal web application? OK, yes. Uh, so on the first question, I, if I'm understanding it right, um, the answer would be, well, the easy answer would be like, yes, much better in Ionic 2. Uh, and the short answer for that is because Ionic 2 has its own custom navigation controller uh, that it uses. So in Ionic 1, we were still using UI router, right, which gave you state-based navigation, but like in a fakey way, right? It wasn't like real state-based navigation because it was still, it was still entirely based on uh, the history API, right, browser history. So uh, in in mobile apps, you actually have you actually have much more complex navigation patterns uh, that you just can't really do with a linear uh, with a with a, a linear uh, <coughs> conception of history like you have like you have in the like you have in the history API. So in Ionic two, we have a fully state based nav controller which works out beautifully because of how Angular 2 is componentized. So that means every time you navigate, you actually, you actually create a new instance of the component. Uh, so you can actually, it lets you do all kinds of really cool stuff like um, you can rearrange, you can rewrite and rearrange history, you can, uh, you can do crazy stuff like navigate to the same component over and over and over and have the state be different in every component. And then as you navigate back, you'll actually see that state is maintained across all the instances. Uh, it's, it's pretty neat. I'll, if you want, I have a demo that I can show you like afterwards that uses tabs that kind of illustrates that. And then, um, I'm sorry, what was the second question? I talked too long. <laughs> <laughs> About to support the, the application to web browser, like web oh, application. Oh, okay, yeah, I mean, so at the, at the end of the day, right, what gets spat out by the Ionic build process is just a normal bundle file. It's just an Angular application. So. The answer is the same way you would do it with an Angular application, basically. Uh -huh. like the, uh, the, the only thing that you would have to be careful of is if you're using a lot of Cordova stuff, right? There's Cordova accesses some device APIs that don't have like HTML5 equivalents. Um, so you would want to be a little, a little careful of that. But other than that, yeah, I mean, you could just deploy it as a standard web, applica web application. And last, last thing. <laughs> What about this Ionic Cloud? It's like a service. I was having a look, and remember, it remembers me to parse.com. I'm not sure what is this for. Oh, yeah. Uh, OK. Uh, can I take like three minutes or something? All right. I have a slide about that <laughs> that, I did, that I didn't show you. Here. But it's easier if I do it this way. All right. Oops. Hang on. So another thing that Ionic offers, right, is a platform as a service, basically, called Ionic Cloud. It's very similar to, you know, other backend as a service, like Parse, right, that you might be familiar with. And all it is is it, at, it offers uh, common server-side functionality that mobile apps need, right? Because one of the big goals of, Ion of the Ionic team has always been, how do we make it so that you don't have to rebuild stu common things, right? Uh, and get on to actually building your app in a way that's gonna differentiate it from other apps. So Ionic Cloud offers a whole bunch of services. There's like a push notification service. Um, we have a build farm, so that it, which is basically like PhoneGap build, so that if you are a PC user, you can just upload your bundle file to our server and it'll spit you back uh, the, the native executables across platform. So uh, IPA, APK, and again, whatever it is that Windows uses, I don't know what it is. And uh, also, I talked about hotfixes before, right, which is a really cool feature of hybrid app development. We have a platform for managing that as well. So doing deploys, uh, like doing code deploys, right, to all of your apps that are live in production, 
uh, as well as support for certain things like A-B testing and beta testing of those features. Uh, also, you can do rollbacks. Uh, I'm a good developer, so I never have to roll back code. I don't know about you, but <laughs> uh, that's a lie. Anyways, uh, so, but there's a platform for doing that. Also, uh, user management, so not just, not just doing uh, manage, you know, management of user profiles and stuff, but doing the, you know, handling the OAuth dance for you all that good stuff. Uh, and also, in kind of in a limited preview, what just started was a service called Ionic DB. And this is, this is a real-time database uh, very, sim very similar to uh, Firebase. Uh, and it's built entirely on open source. Uh, so for Ionic Cloud, if you're interested, ionic.io slash cloud. And it has a really nice free tier as well, uh, which, which is really great if you just want, uh, either if you want to go to production or if you just kind of want to get some of these common features into your app, you know, really quickly as you're building just to see how it'll all come together and work. So 10,000 push notifications a month, you can do 5,000 app updates, 100 native builds, and manage unlimited users. And again, this is a monthly limit, so pretty awesome. Uh, that is Ionic Cloud. That's the very long answer to your question. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely.